Hi, this is Dr. Carl Goldcamp. If you're interested in learning about the ketogenic diet like I was, to save my own life, then this is probably the podcast for you. Eight years ago, I knew nothing about it. Six years ago, it saved my life. Three years ago, I started researching and talking with some of the authorities in the field and attending medical conferences about this to understand why and how keto so dramatically changed my and my wife's Judy's lives. The purpose of this podcast is to share our journey of discoveries with you in understanding how keto is so effective in improving so many different conditions from obesity, epilepsy, diabetes, infertility, MS, Alzheimer's, heart disease, to name a few. So take a step away from all the hype you've probably heard and roll up your sleeves with me and join me weekly to explore this living miracle that anyone can access. We'll talk science, we'll talk food. We'll explore its history and evolution to today, which is that the sheer wonder of the ketogenic way of eating has changed untold number of lives, unlike anything before it. And in case I forget to mention it, please join our Facebook group, Keto Naturopath. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp, and welcome back to the next episode of the Keto Naturopath. I wanted to provide a brief introduction to part one, part two, and maybe even a part three of an interview with a very interesting person. I mentioned it on the last podcast and felt yet I needed to add one more little thing before we started talking. So this is Dr. Joan Ifland, and she deals with the very uncomfortable topic of addiction in general and food addiction and processed food addiction specifically. She has an organization about this. She's written books about this. So you'll find those links on the uh, show notes. So don't worry about that. And I would encourage you to look into PubMed and you'll see some of her research there. But um, I think on her Facebook, not on her Facebook, excuse me, on her website, you will find more than all the information you'll need to know about her. So that link is there as well. So let me get started. This topic is something that has really been with me for the last, oh, I would say the last 20 to if not 30 years. And it was a nebulous topic in the sense that it just wasn't called anything. And if you don't name something, it tends not to be talked about. So in the evolution since the mid-1980s of our food supply, that it's become highly chemicalized. And I'm not talking about pesticides and herbicides and the things that go on the, on the agriculture or perhaps some of the things that are injected or given to uh, our protein sources, our animal sources. Not talking about that at all. That does not qualify for processed foods. What I'm talking about is when you go to, let's say, Trader Joe's and you pull down one of their, oh, I'm thinking of a cheese puff sort of, treat and you think, oh, just a little cheese and it's in a a bag. So what could be wrong with that? Well, there's a lot of other stuff that's added to that. And in addition to cheese being very addictive, dairy being very addictive, which you've now probably heard me say that at least 50 times or 50 topics. Um, it's, It's the stuff they put in the food that you're eating. And so you're thinking, this is convenient. I'm going on a road trip, so I'm going to load up with all these bags of processed foods. Well, it's not as harmless as you would think. And there's a lot of research that goes into the formulation of making these foods very attractive to eat. So you make foods that are basically tasteless, now, and then you start adding all these different things to not only make it taste better, That's just one layer or one level of looking at it. But you add all these things that are stimulating our neurotransmitters, that are making us want more of it. So there's a whole science behind that. And that's what our processed food industry has evolved to. And as you'll learn, it's come from the tobacco companies. In essence, it's the former tobacco companies are now today's food manufacturing companies. They brought their know-how of making everyone be addicted to who smoked, addicted to cigarettes, now be addicted to Captain Crunch, Cheese Crunch, you know, Doritos, you name it. There's probably more non-nutritious food that tastes great, that more people are eating and getting heavy, getting obese, becoming fat, becoming overweight, 
due to this one particular change in our food supply. Other words I was thinking about is like our evolving food supply, but it's a devolution. It's not an it's not a benefit, it's going backwards. Uh, these things that have shelf life for five years, it was a running joke that a Twinkie, so it's a good example of a processed food, could stay unchanged for 20 years. They even thought for a century. So it's not just being preserved so it doesn't rot. It's making it so you want more and more and more of it. So that's the topic for today. And it's perhaps the single most few podcasts coming out, however many podcasts this interview will take, to listen to, because it goes into not only the addictive side of human behavior, but the science side of food manufacturing and putting these things together, and the marketing. Marketing is a little on the sneaky side too. So in case this sounds too malevolent, that I'm being too negative, I don't think so. I think if we're revealing, we're having a, I think is a very pleasant conversation, but going into the data of all this, and uh, I'm really impressed with all the work that Dr. Iflin Joan has done on this, and uh, she deserves a lot of credit. Enjoyed talking with her, enjoyed uh, seeing some of her presentations at various conferences, and I was thankful that she had the time to uh, sit down and talk with me for a long period of time. Okay, good luck. I hope you enjoy. Please take notes. Well, let's just get started. At least we'll enjoy it. (laughs) No, I mean, I I am so with you on this because literally I do absolutely feel that this perspective on eating could save somebody's life. And so uh, that's on the one hand. And on the other hand, they do have a lot of mental challenges, people who eat a lot of processed foods. So getting them engaged and keeping them engaged is not easy. No, not at all. What I like, uh, Joan, so it was really interesting. I met you, what, two conferences ago for you, and, and we talked a little bit, and then we, we left early, but I saw your presentation as soon as I got home, and I go, wow, what did I miss? And, and then the uh, question and answer panel, and I realized that, you know, you have a presentation, and your softness of who you are really gives it this extra power. You know, it's like, well, look who noticed this. And, 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 and the thing is, it's the hardest piece in all this. And I'm, so I have to give you a little context where I'm saying this, you know, so it doesn't sound like it's compliments and so on. You've done a lot of work and I want to get back to your background. But so my context was physician sitting across from this naturopathic doctor, you know, for 16 years, you have your patients come in. It's a one-on-one. I asked for seven day diet diary, recent blood work. We'll do the new blood work. It's not recent enough. And we'll, you know, work at the chief complaint. But primarily, if I put all those people into a hopper and say, what have you done for 90% of the people? It was to get them off processed foods. And this is back before keto, well before I was even keto aware. So nothing to do with that. So that was the profound difference. And if I was to shrink it down even more, uh, I would say, because we would have an elimination diet for those who are willing to do it. And I would definitely have everybody do gluten-free and dairy-free and saying, this is not me judging your, you and your diet. We're going to have an experiment. And now you, know, you know, now you know and you don't know, it is entirely up to you as an adult. And I'll help you, but now you know. So we're not going to not do this because we're afraid we might find something good. That's not where we're going. So that's what we did. That was my practice in a nutshell. So now go forward. Um, I work with people one-on-one, but you know, I've, I've been in uh, with Dr. Westman seeing patients with him, and I obviously have gone to various concert, uh, concerts, right, conferences. And what I realize is that that is too gnarly of an issue for anybody to look at. You know, they don't want to look at food addiction. They, and there's a number of, and they certainly don't want to talk about dairy. You know, don't, don't talk about <laughs> dairy. Dairy is the perfect keto food, um, and and that's all there is to it. So you learn you know, what to talk about, what not to talk about. So along's come you and you present a great presentation about the whole food addiction and your papers are out there, you know, that you've been involved with and uh, your publications, that is, in addition to your book. Um, And you hit it right in there. And I'm wondering, I said, I wonder how this is being received because she's explaining the 60% that the keto doesn't work out for, in my view. You know, it's not a documented view. So anyway, that's where I thought, gosh, this is it. It was an articulation of what was very true and was kind of non-mechanistic in the sense that 
we got to look at the food, folks, before we even get to the keto part. And if we can get to whole foods, we'll call it, then we can then make a step towards keto or not keto and find out what works for people. But there you go. Yeah. Anyway, so yeah. I, I, think you're, I think you're right on track. And uh, I really have to hand it to Doug Reynolds at Low Carb USA for just, if it's controversial, I'm going to put it on. <laughs> and, uh, if people don't like it, well, that's what we're here for. Yep. Yeah. So just for your information, the reaction, particularly to this last one in Seattle, the last Low Carb USA presentation in Seattle, there were, I, my feeling was there were more health practitioners in the room and mm -hmm. fewer individuals, whereas in uh, West Palm Beach, it was the other way around. Right, right. So the, the response from this one was, this is the missing link. This is the piece I haven't had. This is uh, going to change my practice. I, I mean, one doctor said, this is it. I'm devoting myself to figuring out how to get this to my patients. So the, I, I think out of, in the 23 years that I've been doing, because 23 years ago, I, I could have been laughed off the stage. Mm -hmm. Right. Doctors would just guffaw in my face uh, when I mentioned this. And now um, in those 23 years, they've run out of alternatives. You know, they've tried all these things. They've tried diets. They've tried the self-sabotage. They've tried the childhood issues. They've tried the exercise. They've tried the low fat. Um, they've tried the high fat. They've tried all these things. None of them work. And it's because there's, it's not just a garden variety addiction driving the behavior. It's a massive addiction. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, because media gets $10 billion a year from the food industry, they're not going to be talking about it. And because the health industry just grows right along, you can look back because my undergraduate degree is in economics and political science. And I have this MBA. I'm very interested in the influence of business. You can just look back and you can see that, oh, you know, 25, 30 years ago, before tobacco came into processed foods, you see that health and food comprise about, oh, 15%. Combined, about equally, 15% mm -hmm. of the U.S. domestic economy. And then tobacco comes into processed foods. And 20 years later, you see, this is like a pie chart I'm making. Here. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you see, it, it, it just, they grow together. Health industry and food now comprise a third of the U.S. domestic economy. And it's about 15% each. I agree. And, 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 and um, I can cheat here because I can see your slide presentation and you can't, um, but you probably know it by heart. But, so this is, a, I want to put a little more polish in this particular point. What you led us up through, which was one of the missing links, um, was that, you know, after tobacco got revealed that, oh gosh, it's not safe and yep, it has been killing people and they've been lying. They go, well, let's give up and let's go buy the, a, uh, a number of food companies. And so they brought their expertise, this is you in essence talking, brought their expertise in the mid to late 80s and bought various companies to the point they owned, at least at that point, 10% of all the food companies in North America, we'll say. And I'm sure it's increased since then. So now that was the starting point of, we know how to tweak these suckers. You know, it wasn't just tobacco in cigarettes, it was all this other stuff. We put all that other stuff, you know, given our, 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 our scientific chemical uh, neurotransmitter understanding into the food and you know it, there you go away it went so that was the point that you pointed out prior to your talk and your articulation of that it was everybody pointing to the dietary guidelines changed in 77 and I didn't really ever buy that or they would put into the increased fructose and, and that's a component certainly of processed foods but you know that it, you're the one that you could see the inflection in the 80s, not in the late 70s, a whole decade later. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Um, so when you look at the power that the tobacco industry brought to influencing masses of people, you know, it's no, the government doesn't, can't touch that. And nobody could understand the food pyramid, but, uh, and the food pyramid didn't go after the children. 
which is kind of where it's not kind of that is where the tobacco industry went they they couldn't advertise cigarettes to 10 year olds because they were prevented from doing that but they could advertise sugar to newborns they could advertise sugar to toddlers and they went after it with a vengeance 564 commercials per saturday morning cartoon programs for sugary fatty salty foods broadcast by nickelodeon to 65 million households i can tell you that the guidelines did not get out there week after week after week at that volume of bombardment and if you walked up to anybody in a fast food line and you know knocked on the window and said could you could you roll down your window i'd like to ask you a question right. you say are you here because the dietary guidelines they'd like get away from my window right no yeah. i'm here because junior wants the next toy in the series and that's he's right. been nagging me all day that is why those people well that's where they start out and then and I then agree. You have to develop the chemical dependency in the brain yeah right you're right so you laid it out you know first of all of the whole saturday morning thing it sounds like a, it's a it's an off comment but you had you know diagrams are showing before and after they knew exactly where to advertise and just so exploited that and it blew up because that was part of their model. This is what you calling it, the shift in the food industry, by the way, I think that's brilliant. Yeah. Yeah. Um, and it was that, you know, the, that the five A's that we call neuromarketing, you know, and <clears throat> get into more of that. It's like part of was the, the age part, you know, you get them started. And so this was part of a master plan. It wasn't just, Oh, it's oh, more man. advertising across the, the boards. No, 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 no. They're in there, you know, Captain Crunch, as you say, the toys, cereal, I mean, the next toy coming out, they needed to get it. They were clever. They knew all the ways to get them. McDonald's did it too. But that as a, I mean, you, you opened up what their plan was and said, this is what they're doing. This is what they did do. And yeah. now they're doing it again. It's the best. It is. I think what the most, I kind of made a joke of this in the second, uh, the one here in Seattle, which is people have to, uh, it, that what really helps people, I think, is to know that this is a business model. It is the addiction business model. Yeah. It's used by alcohol. It's used by the pharmaceutical companies. It's used by tobacco. Tobacco has used it on processed foods. They've used, they, now they're moving into vaping, which is nicotine based. It's their, that's their comfort zone. Mm -hmm. And they're moving into cannabis. So that is, it's a, business model and it has nothing to do with personal responsibility period no. does not no. no it's a business model that is very specifically designed to create to train the craving neurons to hyper 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 release craving neurotransmitters into the brain and overwhelm the rest of the brain it is a very specific business model based on very specific uh, neurology. Absolutely, let's talk about some of the neurotransmitters these foods hit on. I thought that was equally brilliant. Uh -huh. um, we tend to think that every, all, all roads lead to dopamine and, and that's sort of partially true. But, um, and we can come back to dairy, that's kind of one of my favorite topics, but that how you were saying that no, it's the serotonin, uh, it's you know a, a number of other pathways that these guys have you know, totally triggered. So it's not like this benign little food with preservatives in it. It's not just oh, preservatives. No. no. So the, it, uh, the, the, and this, what's really astonishing to me when I started my doctoral program in 04 mm -hmm. is to find that the research is there. It exists. It's been done. Uh, it's not like we're making stuff up. You noticed probably on my presentation that every slide had a source, yep. uh, a, a reference on it, a citation. The textbook, this is really what put me over on everything, was the textbook. Mm -hmm. And when I say that, what do I mean by it put me over on everything? Um, this is what gave me all the insights into what is really going on. There are 2,000 citations in that textbook. Two thousand studies referenced in that textbook i didn't write every chapter i wrote about 70 percent of it so a lot of these citations are coming from contributors but 
the scientific basis for all of this is there. It's in the research. So we, we have this great foundation to stand on and the textbook is valuable because it all pulls it all together into one place. Right. So we don't, it, this is clear that sugar activates dopamine and flour activates serotonin and the gluteomorphine in grains activates the opiate mm -hmm. and excessive salt activates the opiate. And then cheese, dairy activates the same pathway as marijuana, the endocannabinoid. Right. Endocannabinoid is named after cannabis. So right. you just you see, particularly in these combinations of fast food meals, and then caffeine activates the dopamine pathway. So processed fats activate the endocannabinoid pathway. So you do see that this very clever combination of these major categories of addictive substances into fast food meals. You, they hit across the board, whether it's a hamburger place, a pizza place, or a taco place. You've got all of those elements. You've got the sugar and the flour and the excessive salt and the processed fat and the high fat dairy and the, the caffeine and you've got the gluten. It's, it's Absolutely. massive. It's I'm just going to repeat what you said because I'm, I'm looking up the cheat sheet of one of your brilliant slides. As you said, sugar to dopamine, flour to serotonin, certainly gluten to opiates, so there's the uh, casein, uh, glutomorphines, yeah, yep. uh, salt uh, to opiates, dairy to opiate, that's the casomorphines, a family of uh, processed fats, uh, cannabis, caffeine to dopamine, food additives. So um, now a person listening to this, you know, primarily it's keto interested in, in my audience and how I differentiate it. I'm not trying to pull people along. I'm saying this is my journey. I'm sharing it with you, <laughs> you know, and so it's slight difference. And so somebody's going to go, and it happened in our practice, you know, every patient would go, so what's left to eat? What's, well, uh, how yeah, about, actually, yeah. you know, there's actually a lot. You've just haven't been introduced to it since you were a kid, maybe. And so how do you answer that? Because they go, okay, now I understand. I'm intellectually with you and now nothing's edible in my home. Well, so what, uh, it's very interesting. I had a great talk with uh, Ted Naiman about how he approaches it as a doctor. He says to just get uh, more protein. He doesn't even try to pull any, anybody off of things. He just says, you know, have some eggs with breakfast, have some bacon with breakfast, have a steak with breakfast. And then when they get that routine going, then, they'll, then he'll tackle lunch. Okay. Now, I have a different way of doing it mm -hmm. um, because I have an online service. So I have the Addiction Reset Community, right. AFC, which we call the ARC. And I, uh, I, when people join that, and it's, it's, you know, we have four hours a day of live, right. live meetings, live. Either me or one of my associates is on four hours a day. So what we're able to do then is we're able to engage a part of the brain that is more powerful than the cravings. Right. So the cravings, you know, the research on this is so scary. Yep. When you start to, um, like when they introduce re researchers in Boston did this. It was, no, I'm sorry. I, I'll, I'll get to that study. But yep. so they started, um, they put a 30% sugar solution. They gave it to rats. Within seven days, the first area of the brain that started to hyperactivate was locomotion. Hmm. Locomotion. So what does that tell you? What does it suggest? Which it suggests that before the addiction is going to start to ramp up those craving pathways, it's going to make sure that it can get you to walk over and get the addictive substances. So you think, oh, it's just the craving pathways. Oh, no. No, no, it has reached its tentacles, if you will, into all parts of the brain. Right. It knows even how to shut off the craving, or shut off the brakes. So yep. the brakes that would say, no, thank you. Um, once that craving pathway gets ramped up, it pulls all the blood supply, not all, but it pulls it away from the frontal lobe. And the, the, the no thank you just gets ramped down to... You can't hear it. I agree. And let me let me provide some some details. I deserve it. 
I want it. I've got to have it. It's my birthday. I had right. a bad day. Uh, right. You know, that is the massive broadcasting. And then that addiction can go over here to locomotion and you're just yeah. walking over to get that stuff, even though you don't want to. So what can you do to fight that? You can engage a different part of the brain, equally powerful called mirror. Neurons. That's right. Pause that. You jumped way to the end. I was going to end up there. Sorry. Right. Sorry. What, what, what I wanted to find is some, yeah, no, no, what, it, it's all brilliant. I mean, it's like, and you know it so well, it's, a, it's like a moving, it's an ongoing conversation with you. Is that, so to know what parts of the brain go on and off, it's a PET scan. So we're seeing what parts of the brain light up and also consequently, not just light up, but turn off. Yeah. So, right? So we're turning off frontal cortex. Why is that important? That's, that's conscious decision making. So, yes. now, so however one wants, I'm speaking in, you know, to the audience at large, now we're unplugging uh, interruption and we're saying yeah I'll, you'll get back to that you know it's just not important now so that was clever so this addiction and it you know you name your addiction you know the, the smoking the, uh, it's all there so now we've turned off consciousness so now when we talk about what other parts are being lit up are, is where, where the glucose goes in and we now we know exactly what part of the brain is being turned on so this is no yeah. longer a, a roving sort of symptomatic uh, understanding it is it is neurobiology at its best we know yeah we know so now, when you when you when you ended up on the neuro neuron the mirror neurons, which are in the back of the head, kind of like back of the visual cortex and so on and so forth, it's like I remember when I first heard this context and I dismissed it. You brought it up and put it right front and center. Now we're moving to treatment. You know, it's like how you know. First of all, this is peer pressure. This is like you're you're really saying why does peer pressure work? You know, why did that Saturday morning advertising work? It was obliterated you by just, you now nah, I'm a child, watching the Saturday morning cartoons. I got so much of it. It was my tribe. It was my peers. I got so much of it. It's also, you know, what were the lunch boxes at school? Did they have the Jetson on it or whoever? I wanted that. So it was reinforced. So now the same thing, this peer pressure. Now in, 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 in modern parlance, we've learned it in the, maybe it's the last 10 years, your tribe, you know, get your tribe. And, and this is so fascinating. It's just, it's so easy to miss. That's why I'm sort of per, 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 I'm perseverating on it. It's because, you know, this, you know, we have a Facebook group, as you know, and, and sometimes I wonder how, how helpful is that? You know, it's like, Oh, I think it's really helpful. Yeah. Right. I mean, it was kind of rhetorical, but I, you know, I, this is why I asked to myself, you know, it's like, once you kind of can purify it and set some standards and really have it a safe place, people do what they're getting. We're not part of their tribe or some, you know, we're kind of the least, getting into their consciousness. And, 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 and it's kind of like, as our parents said, however, whoever you spend the most time with, it, it could be TV, it could be your best friends, it could be your athletic buddies, it could be your you know, coffee, co whatever it is, yep. they are gonna be you, you're gonna be they. And, yep. and Americans think, no, I'm an individualist. I, you know, I'm, I'm, no, it's not. This no. is your pressure, this is the stick, this is the glue. So now back to you, you're saying, all right, I, I, I've analyzed all that, and I don't even want to be speaking that much. It's, I've analyzed this and brought it back to, I see how this works. I see where, what they're, apart from the, the neurotransmitters, I think I can use that now as a treatment. Now back to what you're doing. Okay, okay. okay. <laughs> well, first of all, I do want to say that I would love it to, the big piece that I got out of the textbook is this is really severe. And so the big piece I got out of that was a once a week appointment is not going to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, if you had somebody come in who was using alcohol and cigarettes and marijuana and a bit of cocaine and sometimes heroin and, a, you know, regular meth, you wouldn't say, oh, you know, one, one meeting a week will do you. <laughs> That'll work great. No, you wouldn't. You know, the minimum for AA is 90 meetings in 90 days. But I tried that with this. I tried a daily phone call. It was not enough. Yeah. And so you might even say, oh, well, you need to go to two meetings a day. It, yeah. So I had, uh, the, the big breakthrough was Zoom, the platform that we're right. on right now. Um, right. And uh, I wasn't ready for it. So <laughs> I just said, oh, we'll use Zoom. This looks so good. And, uh, I, you know, based on Zoom, I'm going to have a full week morning to night video chat with people. And that was the shock. That was the shock. 
23 years, I've been looking for a reliable way to get people to make clean food and let the processed foods go. And it happened that morning, January 2nd, 2018, uh, you know, a year and a half ago. People started out at the beginning of the day, and you know, Joan, I'm terrified to give up processed foods, or Joan, I cannot weigh and measure because it just sets me in that diet mentality, and then, I, and then I'm paralyzed. Right. And then by the end of the day, well, I ate clean today. Well, I weighed and measured my food. Like, what? What? Right. I couldn't believe it. So, frankly, Carl, I had to reverse engineer this. I had to, like, go back into the research and say, what could possibly explain this? And then, then I got it. And I right. had via a group and eye contact that we had engaged those mirror neurons and the mirror neurons are more powerful than any other part of the brain because the mirror neurons you know if you are in a building and you see people running out of the building those mirror neurons can make you run they can make you take off they can make you join a line they can make you pull your car into the back they, that's Your right. neurons can override everything else in the brain. What and so, I love it. So, in essence, what you're saying and what you're saying, and I've said before, this is right up there with you know the fight or flight risk. You know, there's a time of not asking questions and just taking action. And so, when you go back, you know, for the millions of years we ate, call it ancestrally, a Paleolithic. Now they call it, but you know, for those millions, couple millions of years, it really behooved us to move as a group. You know, you weren't going to stay by the campfire when everybody was leaving. It's like, no, mm -hmm. have that be like one of the top things you respond to. You know, if you're something behind you, you run. You see everybody else leaving, you run. So that behavior has followed us up. And so that is part of us. So this is where that came from. And it's not a sneaky little thing. It's who we are. And no, at our core, we are our tribe. You're absolutely right. I like the way you're saying this. Yeah. I like the way you're saying this. It, it pulls it together. I mean, it shows value of a tribe. It it also says now you came to this aha moment saying, well, Zoom, I could, you know, I can essence and live in their house or with this person. Yes. But so into the business model part of that, you go, no, I'm Joan Nipplin here and I, I have X amount of time to, you know, to put to this. So you have to line up kind of a serial or a group that you can rotate yourself to provide that presence in somebody else's life. Correct? Totally, totally. So we know, I mean, there are two really good books about mirror neurons, and one is called Mirroring, and the other one is called Connection, and they're written by scientists. They're written by people who live in laboratories and do research. One, the Connection book is a group, uh, two, uh, two scientists at Harvard, and the Mirroring book is a scientist at UCLA, I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure. Uh, Italian, wonderful, wonderful writer. Um, so what you see is that mirror neurons work in a group and this is why these one-on-one -on -one consultations don't work. Right. You know, people have said to me over the years, like, okay, so I'm sitting in front of the nutritionist. The nutritionist ex is explaining ratios and macros right. and this, that, and the other thing and my levels of everything. And here's what I'm thinking. I'm thinking, wow, you know, I passed that pastry shop on my way here I saw it last time and I, just, I didn't go in, but I'm going in this time because I know what my favorites are there. They're the, and so, and then, oh, I better say something. Uh-huh. And then last time I got these, but this, this time I'm going to get these and then I'm going to get some extra to put in the laundry room and I'm going to hide those and I can't wait till my husband goes to bed to, like, so I can get them out. Right. Uh-huh. Yes, I see. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then when I get, you know, it's just like, that that craving pathway just t it's 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 what a researcher called thought fusion. Mm -hmm. So that the craving pathway and the stress pathway are very closely connected, and you get to this place where they fire simultaneously. They are wired together, and you think I don't want to eat that. I hate myself for eating that. I'm going to eat that except it's much faster. It's like, I hate myself. I'm going to eat that anyway. Well, I might as well eat the rest of it because I just ate it. Well, I'll go to the grocery store. I hope nobody sees me. God, I'm so fat. I'm such a slob. I hate myself. Mm -hmm. So this is simultaneous craving and stress thinking in the advanced stages 
of the food addiction and um you, you got to break through that and you the mirror neurons can do that they can break through that in fact that will quiet right down if you get into a group when you get into a group you're actually interacting with the group and because you've been able to quiet the craving pathways by eye to eye contact, mirror neurons in charge now, you can actually train those craving pathways to, to kind of settle down. You can train them to stop firing violently all the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In essence, it's a little bit like uh, Ted Neiman said, put in the better food and just have it them making progressively better choices. It's like putting in better information on an eye to eye level that moves out the other stuff, you know, it calms down yeah. the other stuff. So yeah. now their tribe is getting to be better quality decisions. Yeah. Yeah. It, that's exactly it. Um, and that is why we've actually ramped up. We, we started out offering three hours a day and now we're at four hours a day because I'm on the West coast of the U S I couldn't start until eight o'clock in the morning, but that's already 11 o'clock on the East Coast. So we had an associate in the UK who does a chat at one o'clock in the afternoon <laughs> in the UK, but that's eight o'clock in the morning East, seven o'clock in the morning Central. So we, we caught a whole bunch of people on their way to work. I gotcha. couldn't from the, the, the West Coast. So now, um, so we added that hour. And what, whatever your brain thinks about in the first hour of the day yeah. is going to drive the whole day. So we, we needed to add that extra four hours. And people say, what do you do for four hours? You know what it's like? It's like having a really terrific family. Yeah. yeah. So here on the West Coast, they're at 8 o'clock, 1 o'clock, and 5 o'clock. The 5 o'clock is a conference call. It's not mm -hmm. a video chat. And we do record those. And so we have this whole library of, of conference calls that people can use at any time of the day. Mm -hmm. So um, we just, we, it's like having a really great family of people who are exploring interesting questions in their lives. Like what's the difference between self-esteem and self-kindness? And how do you say to somebody, um, no, thank you, you know, really practical stuff like you right. need to be able to go to your ladies club and um you know not eat the stuff yeah i know i agree and, yeah it's it's full i mean those hours just they they fly by it, it is like having the family that i never had I, my family was on processed foods and our particular at reaction happens to be anger irritability mm -hmm. critical nature anxiety and so that negativity was the full vibe in my family of origin. And now it's like, I have these really cool people. It's a little <laughs> bit like my, my college time yep. when you know, we were all learning everything and we would sit down at our meal times and talk about what we were learning and what, and, and the problems in our lives. Yep. And yep. It's so cleansing and it's so calming. So people get off these video chats and they're just like, okay, well, three hours or four hours till the next one. And I've got some stuff to do and I'll get that done. And it's been incredible. People who never had control of their food have control of their food. I love listening to this. And let's pretend that we now have a, a, a gizmo that allows us to do PET scans in the moment and, and in a conversation. You know, I would guess so this is all very extreme uh, hypothesis here. I would guess that what you're doing is now you're sort of lighting up the frontal cortex, you know, and we're saying we're providing, put it in other words now, we're providing that little squeak of consciousness, you know, we're, we're, we're muting or, or, or softening those other voices. And so now these questions that are conscious questions, you know, the difference between uh, self-esteem and self-kindness is like, that's a, a very... Think about it. Yes. And so that shows where their thinking is. They're right up front there. They're right under the skin. Right. And, and, and I think that that's what this is. And so it's like, how do we sort of, you know, conjure, hold, coddle that frontal cortex thinking it and bring it into the moments that they're not on, you know, and it just takes more of that. You had a few other analogies that I thought were, were brilliant. You know, you were saying about, <clears throat> you know, if, in the in context of a, an alcoholic or another addict, you say, you know, you wouldn't say, hmm, 
you drink uh, how much per day? Well, can we just cut down by half? <laughs> you know, it's like, you know, that's as irrelevant as you could possibly get. And yeah, so how does that provide, you know, mirror neurons, frontal cortex sort of thing? It's like, well, we have to provide a moments for different thinking. You know, they're exposed to it. Eyeballs have a lot to do with it, what you just said. So it's not just... You know, a lot of people go away because they're hearing this, you know, for the most part. They're not seeing it, they're not seeing each other. And so they go away, I hear this conversation. Um, they're now saying, I didn't know what I looked at was so important. Well, it is. Particularly who you look at. Right, right. And, and you know, it's a, it's a consciousness of that. And I can see there's a, uh, the nice thing about being online, one is you don't have to go to some church basement to, you know, get in one of the chairs. You're right there in your PJs or wherever. And you feel comfortable, and you have ten. Other Sometimes I'm in my PJ. <laughs> <laughs> right. So I mean, that sets a whole different context for these kind of conversations. You're, you're unarmed, or you're more open. However, you want to look at it. Um, you're safe. You're secure. You're in your home. Yeah. You, if you, if you just so that's another key point to remember is that many people are isolated by their processed food use, mm -hmm. and how to to. And and they're isolated for a good reason, right. because this culture is brutal towards people who are overweight. Right. Brutal, like they don't even want to get in their cars because people will scream things at them on the highway. Just terrible study. It was a great terrible study um, where the researcher asked overweight women to just keep a journal of the number of times per day that they were insulted, threatened, discriminated against. Just abused in some way and it was like five times a day it's incredibly brutal so they're justified in their drive to stay home right. it's dangerous for them out there and sometimes the processed foods have eroded their joints and it's very painful for them to move around or inflame their joints they have depression they have fig fatigue they have brain fog and then they have body shame and what they really need is three or four hours a day spaced out through the day. Are they going to get in their car and drive somewhere and park, you know, get dressed? And some of them have outgrown all their clothes mm -hmm. and, and do that. Through, no, no way. So Zoom is right. the crucial technology, the crucial weapon, the crucial treatment delivery method. It, it, without Zoom, these people would not have control of their food today. It, it is kind of brilliant that the world is flat, you know, and Zoom is part of the flatness of the new world, meaning you could be talking to me if I was in Jakarta or wherever, and it would be just as intimate and just as full. And that's so surprising that um, I, I want to talk more about treatment in a moment. I want to kind of go retrograde here in terms of, of you, because you're, you know, your, your story in itself, even before we got to the mirror neurons and, and your treatment and everything, and it's like how you progressed into saying, you know, how, something else is not right, you know? And so can you tell me about your background? Because that is in itself is such a jewel to go forward. It's yeah. a person's struggle to define something that's a little bit nebulous, but is certainly true. I mean, kind of like we're all on, but you had such a push of, these things can be addressed and they should be addressed. And, and in a time in which it was even more unpopular to talk about any of this. And we know um, yeah. between us, it's still kind of unpopular. You know, we get these cultural norms. It's like, no, we're not going to talk about that. Too messy. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So that's, I like that question because I think the answer to that question explains why the technology is so powerful. Okay. So let's start at the beginning. It really started at conception. So uh, do we have time? <laughs> Wait a couple of hours? Um, no, like, because now we know that whatever the parents are eating at the moment of conception is going to be directly transmitted to the baby, not in the genome, but in how the genome replicates. Right. So the, the, it's the environment that turns on or locks down or opens up segments of the genetic code yeah. so i inherited in that moment and then i grew up in a very traumatic household very angry household occasionally violent and um 
you know, when I had my own kids in 1983 and 84, I really started the yo-yo dieting. And I, now I know that that was making the food addiction much, much worse. But I had food addiction as a kindergartner. As I can remember going to kindergarten, the first time I was away from the kitchen, mm -hmm. I could always go into the kitchen and get a, a slice of white bread with a ton of margarine and sugar on it. When, when I got low or I got craving or I got hungry, that part of the kitchen was always open from uh -huh. day one. Yeah. So I, I could easily establish the addiction in toddlerhood. Mm -hmm. And then, um, you know, because I grew up in the, in the 1950s and 60s, we didn't have snack food. So the tobacco industry was not yet in to processed foods, mm -hmm. which meant that we had meals. And even though this little snacky thing was available between meals, the, with my mother for somehow, somehow had the presence of mind not to let us watch TV. So we, we could watch those Saturday morning cartoons, but otherwise it was like a couple of half hour programs through the week. I don't know how she knew to do that. So we didn't get the, the bombardment from TV and, and we didn't, the, the product wasn't available. You know, the, I have to move back. The snack bags that are this big, we didn't have them. Right. So even though I was fully addicted all through my childhood, I was rail thin, rail thin. I developed my first eating problem when I moved to Germany and we lived across the street from the, from the bakery. Um, but then I was able to take that off easily. And then, but when, once I had those back-to-back -back pregnancies, I got into the yo-yo dieting. Hmm. And I would do, I would starve myself which I now know makes cravings much more intense. I put the weight back on. Mm -hmm. And um, I did that for, I guess, about 10 years. And then my, but my personality was deteriorating so badly. I was angry and occasionally raging. And the raging was so intense that I would be like over here raging and I would be bifurcating. I would be watching myself rage. It was that bad. And I didn't want to be. So I was doing all kinds of things. I was doing, I did personal therapy for, I don't know, on and off for 10 years. I did a woman's group. I did this really intense training with them to help women touch back on their core experiences. Mm -hmm. And I, um, then I finally ended up in a 12-step group for codependency. And it was there. Another woman heard the sugar driving my crazy behavior. And a couple of times during that year, she said, why don't you go into food addicts and recovery? And I was thin at that time. I'm like, what do I need that for? I'm thin. <clears throat> so, but at the end of the year, I'd regained the weight. So I got the food addiction book and I turned right to the food plan. And that first week of January, 1996, I could follow any food plan. My goodness, I was a dieter. So uh, I did notice that four days into this, I knew I wasn't going to lose any weight because there was way too much food on it and I wasn't hungry and irritable. Mm -hmm. But on day four, the cravings stopped. I didn't know I had cravings. I ask people all the time, do you have cravings? They say, no. I said, do you think about food between meals? Oh, all the time. That's a craving. Right. People don't know that's a craving because my very first memory of all time is of trying to uh, manipulate an ice cream truck driver into giving me a free ice cream. My very first memory. So <laughs> yeah, and I stopped. And I had just given up the sugars and flowers. I hadn't given up all the other addictive substances. That was shocking to go from breakfast to lunch without thinking about food. The fatigue cleared up. So I was tired all the time. I thought, well, this is, I have kids. Yeah. I would wake up tired. I would take a nap tired. I was just tired all the time. And that stopped. It stopped on day four. And then the brain fog lifted. Mm -hmm. I didn't know I had brain fog, but it lifted. Like, I, literally, if you've ever had brain fog, you know when it's gone and it's painful. Brain fog is painful. And then at the end of that week, I'd lost two pounds hmm. just from giving up the sugar and flour. But I got into this in the third week. So in the, in the intervening three weeks, I, the bloating went away, the allergies went way down, the asthma went way down, 
the sinuses finally drained, uh, all the inflammatory stuff just got so much better. And then in the third week, I'm standing in my kitchen and I'm thinking to myself, wow, nobody in my family has needed to be yelled at in three weeks and nobody really screwed up and needed to be criticized. And I haven't had a meltdown or a raging fit in three weeks. This is about the food. And it was just like, you know, the whole ton of bricks. But I did go to the support group and on Saturday I went and I asked if people become less irritable. 20 people in the room, yeah. We do, we become less irritable. I'm just like, oh, dang, you know, 10 years of therapy and all those women's groups, it was the freaking food. So I started, I started with a handout. I made a list of all the clean food that I knew about. And I thought, my, my girls went to a, a small school and I, I told every other parent, nobody did it. I said, well, you know what? They need to know how to do it. I wrote a whole book, 100,000 words, a popular book. So well, I'll explain to them how to do it. That book was in the top 3% of Amazon books. I got in with a PBS producer in Houston and she made some really beautiful shows about it. No, I didn't. It's just like people would read it. They'd come up to me. That was a great book. They, yeah, I gave up sugar. Yeah, but how about the flour? You know, it didn't work. It didn't work. So um, I said, you know what? I'm going to go back. Uh, so I started doing one on one because I was giving talks. People come to my home for an hour a week. They could not start or they started and they fell off. So that wasn't working. I even learned like a tapping system. I said, well, I'll, you know, work on their energy system. It worked, yes, but like, am I going to do that one person at a time? <laughs> no. So I went back to school to get my PhD. I said, I'm going to teach the teachers. And um, I got through that program in three years. Two major things out of that program. One, the research is there. Shocking. This is known. A lot of the studies in this book were published you know, by now it's 2004. I did that program 2004 to 2007. MRI technology, brain imaging technology had been in existence since the late 1990s. It was known. You could see that the brain of an overeater and the brain of a drug addict were doing the same thing. It was known. It was known. So that was one shocker. And the other one, from my internship, I did an education program in a small church in South Houston, and that worked. So the members of that community over two years got it and worked the food plan and got all the benefits. And I could hear them talking to each other, you know, in, when I was in line for the potluck on Wednesday nights. Oh, my knees don't hurt anymore. What do you mean your knees don't hurt? And I'm not spending every afternoon on the couch. What do you mean? And it's just like, so that worked. And that should have been my big clue. Mm -hmm. You know, when I started there, the dessert table was piled high on Wednesday night. And at the end of two years, there were two desserts on that, little, two little lonely desserts on that table. That should have been my clue. Mm -hmm. That it was all about mirror neurons. Okay, so... Uh, I got the degree, I'm writing papers, and I'm writing chapters for other books, and it's not helping. It's like nobody's like going on fire about it. In fact, they're mad about it, you know. But, but the papers and chapters are being cited, so I'm, I'm kind of hopeful. But it doesn't start the revolution that I was really hoping for. It wasn't a reliable method. What I was looking for was a reliable method that would get somebody off of processed foods. Then I tried a prepared meal company. I said, well, I'll just give them the food. They'll feel so much better. And then they'll do it for themselves. And no. <laughs> but another incredibly valuable thing from that experience was we were serving a very high-end law firm. We were serving Fulbright Jaworski. And I would talk to those lawyers at the end of the week, their first week, and they'd say like, you know, my cravings are gone and uh, it seems like I'm thinking more clearly and I don't have those energy slumps through the day. Do you think that's about the food? I'm like, oh yes. So 
what that showed me is that this is everywhere. This is everywhere. By then I had done the original research myself on the vast quantity of processed foods disappearing into the US domestic economy, a pound per person per day of sugars, including high fructose corn syrup, flours, corn and gluten containing, high fat dairy and french fries, a pound per person per day. And at that rate, it had reached the highest levels, the highest functioning people. You know, this is these lawyers, they're chosen from the top of the law school classes. Mm -hmm. And they work these incredible hours. They're the, probably the most highly functioning people on the planet. Like maybe right. astronauts are more highly functioning. I don't mm -hmm. know. Especially trial attorneys. For a second, when you, mm -hmm. now when you look back, do you, and I think we all think this way, and or maybe it's just me and I'm admitting my small mindedness, but do you categorize them as a certain sort of a group of people that have to be more conscious about what they're doing? So you brought this to them. Did they pick it up more quickly than others and saying, you know, I think you're on a attached to it, I would say. And but they also had the money. Yep. So I couldn't I realized that even though I thought my price was really low and very reasonable, I couldn't sell it. So that I closed that business. And then, uh, and then I was approached by CRC Press to write the textbook. I wrote the textbook over three years and that's where I got it. This is a very, very serious, severe addiction. And then, you know, the end of the story, I kept, so I, I started a Facebook group. I said, well, the queuing is a big, big part of this, the, the triggering, the messaging, the reminders, the stimulation, this is where it really starts. That's very clear in the research, is that this is a cued response. Now, eventually the cue can start to be your own thoughts. Like, right. I hate myself can be a, a, a major cue. It can be internalized. But the, the big thing you gotta stop is the external cueing. Mm -hmm. So that was, that was that plus the severity finding like there are 11 criteria that are used to diagnose addictions mm -hmm. and i wrote one chapter on each criteria that's how much evidence there is wow. i think that the chapter with the least number of citations has 25 citations and probably up to 100 so there's that much evidence that people who are troubled by overeating are are exhibiting addictive behaviors right right Okay, so that was huge. That was huge. And I realized that almost every food addict I had ever worked with had 10 or 11 of those criteria. And you only need six to find, uh, to have a finding of severity. Right. And so then that's when I knew a once a week appointment, no way, that is not going to do it. You need the equivalent. I mean, we're not going to send a, a couple hundred million people to residential treatment. Right. right. No. And the problem is, as you were saying, when they come back from residential treatment, they go into a massive binge trigger yeah. because people binge and they overeat at home in secret. So, or they, they overeat with their families. They have binge nights, like Friday night pizza nights. Those are binge nights. Uh, You're teaching your children to binge. Um, so they go back to that massive triggering and they relapse. It's like, no, <laughs> you have to do this at home. You have to yeah. gradually reprogram your brain to associate recovery with that building and those people and and no longer associate relapse or processed food use with that building and those people. Hi, this is Dr. Goldcamp. I thought I would take a moment of your time to tell you about something that we've been working on for a long time. And that is our product of C8 Keto MCT oil. How is it different and why would you even care about it? It's the highest purity you can find in the market, which is 99.7% caprylic acid triglyceride. And by the way, that's backed up by a certificate of analysis. It's not just me making up these numbers. But I think the bigger story behind our C8 MCT oil is not only that it is the most efficient way for you to create ketones naturally, 
And that is all three ketones, your beta-hydroxybutyrate, your acetoacetate, and your acetone. That's important. But the other part is it supports sustainably harvested palm oil. Why would you care? Because all the other C8 oil products out there, not the MCT oils, but the C8 MCT oils, some people call them ketogenic oils out there, they come from palm oil. And palm farming, specifically palm kernel farming in Southeast Asia, is decimating the rainforest there. Absolutely. You go on right now to Google or to YouTube and say palm oil Southeast Asia, and you will be in tears at the end of 10 minutes when you see the destruction that's happening. This is not part of that. This is the exception. So it's called RSPO, Roundtable on Sustainable Palm Oil. You have to apply for it. You have to be audited by them. And it's a long, rigorous process. And it took us two years to bring this product to market. I hope you care. And I know you'll care about the efficiency in which it helps you make ketones. By the way, we don't drink this like it's a fluid. We put a little bit in our coffee. We make our mayonnaise out of it. We make... Uh, various salad dressings out of it when we have a salad. It's basically a, I hate to say crutch, but it's my aid to keeping me in ketosis when I want to be in ketosis. It's fast. It's long lasting, certainly long, longer lasting than exogenous ketones and much more holistic, as I mentioned, with all three ketones. That's about as much as I want to say. I hope you look into it. I hope you uh, take your ketones readings on a regular basis as along with your glucose. If you do, then you really value this product. All the best, and I thought you should know.